Well, good afternoon. Welcome to the GSA Momentum discussion on the evolving and essential role of interdisciplinary care of the mouth, ears, and eyes of older adults, which in and of itself is a bit of a mouthful, but such an important topic. We are really pleased that you are here with us today on a very timely topic. For those of you who have been tracking what's been going on in Washington related to dental vision and hearing for older adults, you could not have picked a more timely way to spend this hour with us. I'm Tricia Newman. I'm a senior vice president at the Kaiser Family Foundation, sometimes known as KFF. And I have the privilege of moderating this discussion on a really important topic today. This session will run for an hour. We'll start by, um, I'll ask some questions to our panelists and we will do our best to save time so that if you have questions, you can uh, put them in the chat function and we'll ask them later on in the program. And I'd love to introduce our panelists now. We couldn't have a better set of people to be talking about these important issues starting with Kira Baldonado, who's the Vice President of Public Health and Policy at Prevent B B Blindness. Dr. Frank Lynn, who's the Director of Cochle the Cochlear Center for Hearing and Public Health at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, my alma mater, so I have a deep attachment there, and a Professor of Otolaryngology at Head and Neck of the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. And Michelle Saunders, who's an adjunct professor and director at South Texas Geriatric Education Collaborative in the Department of Psychology and Periodontics at um, UT Health Science Center in Texas. So what a great group of experts to talk about these issues. For those of you who want to find out more about our panelists, a complete set of their bios and references are in our handout. Okay, with that introduction, I'd love to get going on our topic today. We are gonna be talking about vision, hearing, and dental for older adults, a topic that is being debated as we speak on Capitol Hill. Uh, as you know, Medicare does not cover vision, hearing, and dental. They are largely uncovered by Medicare. And this has been a, a longstanding concern and we're gonna talk more about why it's a problem. For example, roughly half of all people on Medicare have no dental coverage and nearly half of all beneficiaries on Medicare didn't visit the dentist in a recent year, and that had nothing to do with COVID. Um, among people in communities of color, the, the rates are much higher. Two thirds have not, didn't go to a dentist. I suspect Michelle is gonna be telling us a little bit about why that may be a problem. And we're also going to be hearing similar issues with respect to vision and with respect to hearing. Costs are a major barrier to care uh, Out-of-pocket spending is a huge issue, but that's only an issue for people who can afford it. Others go without needed care and bear the consequences. Congress is now debating the Build Back Better legislation. And I have to say, when we were planning this session, we thought the, the bill would include vision, hearing, and dental coverage under Medicare. At this very moment, it looks like it will only include hearing uh, I think due to budgetary constraints uh, in the legislation moving forward. That said, we will be talking about all three of these issues because we know they're very, very important. Um, I am gonna start though with um, Frank Lynn, if that's okay, because there is this hearing benefit in the legislation. And I guess my question to you is, if the proposed hearing benefit becomes law, what will it do? What will it mean for older adults? And what would be the consequences if the legislation fails? Mm. Um, great question, Trish. And again, thanks, thanks to everyone for joining and for the GSA for inviting me. Um, so hearing is, is one of those elephant in the room issues when it comes to older adults. I mean, this is, I mean, two thirds of all Medicare beneficiaries have some degree of a hearing impairment, which, which impacts uh, essentially their daily life. And I think for many years, as, as probably many of you realize, um, uh, hearing aids, any related services are statutory exclusions under Medicare uh, ever since it was established in 1965. And that was back, that was because back then hearing was seen as, eh, you know, something that you didn't really worry about and there weren't, weren't treatments available back then. Um, so the, the legislation as it currently came out of the House uh, essentially last week, um, what it would do is actually really interesting. It would begin covering for everybody 
uh, hearing care services. So you could see an audiologist or another, other hearing a professional for uh, hearing rehabilitative services. So you could be seen to get counseled about what to do about your hearing and things like that. And that right now is not covered at all. You can't, you can see an audiologist get hearing tested, but anything around counseling services, not covered. Um, then what's interesting, uh, because it builds off and leverages another previous piece of legislation that passed several years ago, is that if you have a mild to moderate hearing loss, which is probably about 85% of people with hearing loss in that age range, you actually don't get hearing aids. Your hearing aids are expected to be covered on your own. And that's only possible because the legislation that was passed a few years ago, which is going to go into effect later next year, which is the Over-the-Counter Hearing Aid Act. So basically, if you have a mild to moderate hearing loss, which again is about 85% of people with hearing loss, you buy your hearing aids on the own in the private market, which, and that's going to evolve in the next year when there's basically companies like Samsung and Bose are widely expected to make hearing aids that'll be available on the open market. You just go to drugs and buy them. But if you need service around that, you could still get the rehabilitative counseling you initially need from an audiologist. Then if you have a moderately severe greater hearing loss, that's more in the minority, uh, then prescription hearing aids do become covered. So it was actually, we considered back then, sort of, or even now, a relatively an efficient way of covering services and devices because the device cost gets split across and shared by the consumers. And it's possible in a free market where there's essentially hearing aids are more competitively priced, but then even more severe hearing loss and prescription hearing aids do become covered. So, um, and I, I think that in the end, the, the reason why the hearing benefit ended up being a little cheaper, uh, quite simply, was because you're not covering hearing aids for everybody. That would be almost... It'd be a tough sell to say the least, but since the majority of people will be expected to buy their own hearing aids, um, that clearly saves them some efficiency in terms of the delivery of that benefit. That's terrific. And when you say cheaper, um, just to be clear, we're talking about in the order of 30, 35 billion dollars, which isn't cheap for, for in sort of <laughs> everyday language, but in terms of yeah. a program that serves 62 million people, it's relatively cheap and that's over many, many years. It's over a 10 year budget window. Yeah. Thank you, that's really helpful. Um, Michelle, uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Just a few weeks ago, the last time we talked, we thought that, that we were on the cusp of uh, having a dental benefit in Medicare. And there was a lot of excitement about that. I guess I'd like to hear your thoughts on, I suppose why it would have been so important and what your thinking is about what are the consequences of inaction in this particular case? That's, that's really uh, intense if you think about it uh, for all of us. And dental care in Medicare, while it's looking like it might not go anywhere, um, there are certain coalitions that GSA is working with right now in an attempt to let some of the more difficult legislators understand what the consequences are if these things do not pass. And obviously um, in terms of providing a prevention benefit for dental in Medicare, it would save billions of dollars of tertiary care that would end up being needed because there's no prevention. And um, I also understand that um, these same groups are working with some of these senators to let them understand the same about hearing loss. So we'll see uh, if it goes anywhere, but um, there are serious consequences obviously to overall health. People die from oral infections. So you're actually saying don't give up hope that there still is some prospect for action from your perspective? Right, though small. Yeah, and I guess I would ask you, or we can come back in a minute, but I, would, I think I'm gonna come back and ask each of you to be more specific about the consequences of, uh, so maybe while you're here, while, while you're speaking, when you say the consequences are, are billions of dollars of, of service use that could have been avoided or people die, or what are there health risks that, that go along with it short of death that could be preventable illness? Well, one, one example would be, for example, someone having a canine abscess. If you have a canine abscess, that canine, if you have pneumatized sinuses, meaning your sinus, your maxillary sinus is no longer big. It is now just a thin membrane. It's huge. Your thin membrane between the root 
of your canine and that sinus can be broken through by an infection if that tooth is not treated. So that's just one example. You don't want a cerebral abscess uh, because of it. That, and so there are others. Yeah, no, I definitely would not want that. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, Kira, can we talk, talk about vision care and tell us um, that the vision benefit of the proposed legislation was somewhat limited and people thought it was, uh, it could have been more generous. It was mostly eyeglasses or contact lenses for a limited period of time and help right. toward paying for that. Do you see that? So that is no longer in the proposal that's being debated in the House side, although maybe that could come back in the Senate too. But do you see, what do you see about the risks of not doing something more on vision care? And did you think that benefit was adequate to what was actually needed? Um, yeah, there's several parts to that question. Um, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> no problem. Um, you know, as, as Frank alluded to, um, you know, the, the budget for hearing was a bit cheaper because of the, the smaller population that might be impacted. When we're talking about vision in the Medicare population, it's really an issue for nearly 100% of that population. 99.6 of Medicare beneficiaries have some kind of health reported vision issue that can be uncorrected refractive error, which an eyeglass benefit would certainly take care of. Um, that would include individuals that have reduced or lost vision, also called low vision. Uh, we have individuals that have a diagnosis of legal blindness, those that have a need for uh, an assistive device to help them see and function, uh, those that have cataracts, glaucoma, diabetes-related retinopathy, macular degeneration, all of this just tends to skyrocket at that age of 65 uh, and take over. So we were certainly uh, dismayed when um, they took out the benefit that at least we could provide a conference of eye exam and eyeglasses for individuals, which would take care of a majority of the issues, the uncorrected refractive errors for this population. And what does an improved pair of eyeglasses mean for an older adult? That means they're able to read their mail, to do their needlework, to watch TV, to drive, to be able to read the labels at the grocery store, to be independent and not be isolated from society. Um, so, well, it might just seem like, well, you know, now they have to pay a couple hundred bucks. Um, if they're lucky for a pair of glasses, what they're really not getting is being able to be independent, function in society, and maintain their, their, their mental health um, where they can be their own person. So it means a lot more than just getting a pair of glasses. And as you mentioned, the, the depth of the benefit that was offered, certainly um, with the issues that impact this population, it needs to go a lot deeper, especially in the areas of low vision and low vision. Yeah, I mean, actually, social isolation and related mental health issues is a is a con concern related to all three vision, hearing, and dental. Right? If you can't hear, you withdraw. If you can't see, you you may not be able to connect socially. And if you don't have teeth, that creates a lot of issues about people who feel shame, who don't want to go out in public. If you can't hear, you know, so it it really is across the board and. I think with vision and hearing in particular, falls are a real concern, right? Because if you're not, if you don't hear what's coming, you you may stumble, you may fall. And for older people, that's obviously a huge risk. Um, I guess what I'd like to do is get your perspective on an issue that has come up this year. Some people do have vision, hearing, and dental. In fact, the majority of people who are in Medicare Advantage plans these are Medicare plans that receive payments from the federal government. They provide all Medicare covered benefits and most provide extra benefits like vision, hearing, and dental. Uh, they, they're HMOs and PPOs and they are becoming increasingly popular for people on Medicare. Almost half of all people in Medicare are in a Medicare Advantage plan. Some people say, you know, these are this is good enough and that people should if they want to have vision, hearing, and dental, they should just sign up for a Medicare Advantage plan. And that's fine for them. And the low-income people can get these benefits through Medicaid. 
I guess I'd like to get your take on what that, what, what that, how that really works. Uh, would you say that works well for your patients? If you're seeing patients, is it adequate? Tell me more. So maybe for that one, um, well, Kara, why don't we start with you? Sure, thank you. Um, so having access to a comprehensive eye examination, eyeglasses is great for those 25, 30% of individuals that can get and afford that Medicare Advantage plan. Um, but what that, that doesn't provide and that Medicare does not provide because there's, there's actually an exclusion to a lens benefit uh, in Medicare is any kind of support that an individual might need to be functional or to address low vision issues. Um, right now in the US, there's about 7 million individuals who are blind or visually impaired. So it's not a small population that we're talking about here. Um, so what, um, what that Medicare Advantage plan does not provide, what Medicare does not provide um, is any sort of benefit for somebody who may need a magnifying glass or may need uh, a closed caption TV or may need um, some kind of vision rehabilitative device, as well as the training in using that device and the support to use that device. For example, under Medicare right now, you can't even get a white cane if you're visually impaired or blind, um, but you can get a regular cane for mobility. So there are just some basic things around vision that are either excluded because of this lens exclusion that needs to be addressed in policy or just overall lack of awareness and, and actual attention to vision and what the vision needs are of a significant proportion of our population that needs to have support for vision. So, so that, that loss of the vision benefit is really just kind of the tip of an iceberg that, that we have for vision and shows how it's really been divested from the rest of the body for us, from our, our opinion. Thank you. Um, Michelle, do you have experience with the vision, with, with sorry, the dental coverage and Medicare Advantage plans or Medicaid that might be instructive? Yes. Uh, and I would suggest actually that people uh, go to Susie Orman's website to find out what Medicare Advantage plans can and cannot do. In dental, it's usually minimal oral health services and it's usually 20% of the cost at best. One of the things about Medicare Advantage plans is that if you become seriously ill and you need to go to a traditional Medicare plan, you can't, they won't let you. So your coverage for everything will end up being limited. Uh, Medicaid coverage for oral health and older adults pretty much varies from state to state with the vast majority being emergency care only for nursing facility residents and some having one cleaning or x-rays per year, but those are not all by any means. Most states get uh, waivers. So just to follow up on that, um, yeah, we also did some research looking at uh, dental coverage under Medicare Advantage plans and found they tended to be capped um, when they were offered maybe $1,000, $500, $1,000, something like that. I think the median was $1,300. But I do want to circle back on what you said that uh, about people not being able to move back to traditional Medicare because maybe what you were thinking is not, less during the open enrollment period because during the open enrollment period, people can leave Medicare Advantage and go to traditional Medicare, but they might not be able to buy a Medigap policy. That's correct. And that's, and that's a serious problem. Yes. And that's actually because Medigap is one of the few products out there in the health insurance world that has um, no guarantee issue protections. So people with right. pre-existing conditions on Medicare might be denied a policy or charge more for it. Yeah, thanks. Thank you for that clarification. Frank, what's been your experience with Medicare Advantage? So um, at least specifically for hearing, uh, hearing care coverage, hearing aid coverage under Medicare Advantage plans, it's, um, I mean, not to put it lightly, it's a little bit of a joke. And, and what I mean by that is uh, the, the average cost of a pair of hearing aids nowadays in the United States, uh, this is according to several years ago, according to the National Academies, is basically $4,700, $4,700 for a pair of hearing aids, which is, I mean, a little crazy, right? I mean, that could be for the average American, your third largest uh, 
material purchase in, in, in life after a house and a car, right? Uh, so Medicare Advantage plans that offer hearing, hearing aid coverage, but what uh, the vast majority do is they contract out to the third party provider. These are third party provider networks of uh, hearing aid audiologists and, and hearing aid providers, which if you do the digging, many of them are owned by manufacturers of hearing aids, right? So what the benefit often becomes is if you see a certain audiologist in that network, you may get a discount on your hearing aid. So rather than paying $4,700, you may get a $500 discount or a $1,000 discount off a $5,000 thing. So I hate to say it's a little bit of um, bait and switch. It's like, you know, you see those ads, you know, be the first 20 callers, you get $1,000 off of a $10,000 product. Well, it's, it's, it's not quite to that, but it's very, very similar. Um, so yes, theoretically, it is a benefit but that benefit is essentially meaningless. Your, your patients, uh, my patients are, are far better off a lot of times actually ironically going to Costco. Costco has a phenomenal actually hearing care, hearing aid program for my own in-laws got their hearing aids. Um, so yeah, then the, in short, the Medicare Advantage plans for hearing care coverage um, don't really do a thing actually. In lip service, it looks good when you say they have a hearing aid benefit, but if you did a digging, it's not much. And with the big problem behind that is that um, uh, traditionally, historic for the last 30, 40 years, uh, hearing aids are always bundled together. The gatekeepers, the hearing aids are basically through an audiologist. That they, they're, they're the, they're, that the cost actually isn't just the hearing aids, also the services involved. So one of the big things and why we're very enthusiastic about the current framework of the, of the uh, Medicare benefit for hearing is that it splits it, it splits it apart. As in there's the services, the counseling rehabilitation services, which is distinct from a hearing aid. Um, and I think that's that's one very thing, very important thing that um, that the Medicare legislation would do right now. At least it starts divorcing services from devices because they're two very distinct things. Yet at the same time, it's a defined benefit, so people can get a device, not just a discount off of a device. That's absolutely and right. Because it's covered, it would be covered under what I'll call regular Medicare. Medicare Advantage plans would need to do the same because there's that requirement that they have to provide benefits at least equal to what Medicare is provided or equivalent. Yeah. We have an interesting comment um, coming in that said the major concern we have in Minnesota is the tremendous variation and complete confusion among consumers and dental providers about what is and is not covered under Medicare Advantage plans. I mean, understandably so. The typical person on Medicare has a choice of of more than two dozen Medicare Advantage plans. And I, I know I'm not in Minnesota, but I certainly spend a lot of time helping family and friends choose plans. And it's quite confusing to find out what, what is and is not covered. And I don't know that people look first at say dental or hearing benefits when they're choosing a Medicare Advantage plan, but I can tell you that they're advertising some of those benefits because they're really attractive to people. And yet, you have to dig pretty deep in the website to understand exactly what's covered and what's not covered. I mean, that has been my experience and I don't know if it has been yours. It's, it's just not so easy for a consumer. It's not so easy for a researcher to actually find out the, the limits of coverage and how they would play out for enrollees. Um, I'm gonna pivot a little bit and talk a little bit more about interdisciplinary care and how you see this approach working within your individual fields and whether or not you have thoughts about what more could be done to promote interdisciplinary care. So why don't I start with um, Michelle, because you are nodding, I'm most nodding enthusiastically away. about that question. Yes. yes, and the reason I'm nodding about that is because there was an excellent symposium yesterday afternoon. And one of the things that they addressed was a way to solve our screening issues from discipline to discipline. The joy of an interdisciplinary team is that you learn a lot about other people's discipline. So for example, someone who's coming into a dental office could also get a, a screening, a hearing screening, because if the person can't understand what you're saying, then you can't instruct them very well. And it's also vision, because if they can't read the sheet that you're giving them with their oral self-care instructions on it, that becomes an issue. And it's also cognitive impairment because they can't follow your directions. And so you can set up a referral network 
every single discipline can do this. So we can do screening if we learn more about one another's profession and become more interdisciplinary in that sense. Before I turn to others, I want to encourage everybody who's listening into the session. If you have questions, please submit them and I'd be happy to ask them as we go along. I can ask questions all day because I'm enjoying this so much, but I also want to make sure that you know that you have an opportunity to submit questions. Um, so Michelle, thank you for that. Um, uh, Frank, do you want to talk about an interdisciplinary approach when it comes to hearing? Yeah, so I think this is a, you know, this is my, uh, so I, I, I'm an ENT surgeon, so I'm not an audiologist, but I know I, I collaborate with a lot of my audiologists, obviously. And, you know, one huge issue with right now, um, how Medicare coverage is, is that uh, for a patient to see audio, for an audiologist, first of all, they have to get a medical referral, uh, which is a barrier. But then on top of that, though, um, if you send a patient to see an audiologist about their hearing, the only the audiologist is paid to do is just do a hearing test. So anything about talking to a patient about, oh, you know, Ms. Smith, you could also just use your phone to help you, or you could do this and that, that is not covered. So um, that is why audiologists to earn any revenue for that, they have to sell a patient a hearing aid. So it always, has a, many always feel like they always are constantly trying to sell something, which is not what they want to do. Um, so one issue with that then is that audiology in terms of interdisciplinary care are usually completely cut out of the entire medical network in many ways because uh you know i talked to a lot of my friends who are primary care providers like well i, I can't i don't bother saying my patients are audiologists because um, they can't afford a hearing that can they don't want to get a hearing aid things like that so i think one one nice thing at how the current framework the legislation works right now is that um and an audiologist to talk to a patient just provide rehabilitative service of what i would do in clinic uh what i actually did talk, talk, talk to my patient about you know what you could possibly do that 20 30 minutes counseling of unbiased conflict-free advice Right now, they can't get from anybody. In the future, that's what would happen. And we're really encouraged by that because I think that's what opens the door for a primary care provider wanting to send a patient to an audiologist to address hearing needs and hearing concerns. And hopefully in the future, this unresolved in the legislation, whether or not there could hopefully be direct access. So rather than having to first get a referral just to see an audiologist to counsel about these issues or, or um, the testing, there may in fact be direct access as well. So um, uh, much of that, that's how most insurance plans work now. There's direct access to audiologists. In Medicare, there's still not though. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Kira. Yeah, and in, in relation to vision, I think there's a lot of opportunity for um, interprofessional relationship development, um, especially because there are great emerging technologies that can help to um, ease the, the burden of screening or detection of a possible vision problem uh, in settings that may be outside of an eye care provider's office. So uh, integrating screening devices, tools in primary care settings and in public health settings and senior care settings to help identify vision problems, educate the individual and get them connected to eye care. The one area that we do need to see some improvement on is the ability of primary healthcare professionals to refer to not only ophthalmologists, but optometrists and have back and forth communication between those professions where there's really not very much happening right now. So we need to see improved communication between those professionals. Uh, and also we need to see vision as a consideration in other areas of the patient's health. Certainly that's happening for those with diabetes, but as a part of a screening for falls assessment or a screening for mental health assessment, social isolation, other issues that are getting much more attention, screening for vision health should be a part of that so that it can be a part of the discussion and the, the plan for a solution for that individual. So there's a lot of areas of overlay and now some of the emerging tools to make it a lot easier, more natural to integrate it into these other professions. That's really helpful, thank you. Um, we do have some interesting questions coming in. So let me, I'm gonna um, back up. This is just backing up a little bit on, on dental, which um, was a question that came in that actually hasn't been raised which has to do with dentist accepting Medicaid and whether that is an issue for older adults to qualify for Medicaid and then segueing into what does it mean for Medicare? Would denti Do dentists participate in Medicare? Would they participate in Medicare? And sort of what was the thinking going on during the debate around the Build Back Better legislation and HR3 when uh, Congress was moving forward with the dental benefit. Michelle, do you wanna speak to that? Yes, I, I would say that primarily the concern of 
of the American Dental Association is that it used to be about not wanting a third party telling them what to do. And now it's about adequate remuneration for whatever service the legislation would allow them to provide. And in addition to that, whatever legislation lets them do, if it happens, there will be some sort of quality measure requirement that would be necessary for dentists. And that's time consuming and it's a reporting issue and an additional expense for them unless they're hooked up uh, through the internet to a reporting mechanism. So they have a lot of concerns. It's hard to say if they, they would participate, though I would say the vast majority of dentists, if you ask them um, who are not speaking through the ADA, would say that they would love to see it happen because their patients want it. Right. Um, you know, just as a reminder, when Medicare was enacted, the dentists wanted nothing to do with it. The doctors wanted really nothing to do with it, but they were kind of forced into uh, being a part of Medicare. And now virtually all doctors participate in Medicare with some exceptions. Psychiatrists don't really like to participate in, um, in health insurance generally. And actually oral surgeons don't like to participate so much in Medicare. But other than that, most doctors actually do participate in Medicare. Medicare has very high participation rates. So it, you kind of wonder whether or not dentists would participate. And I, I, you know, I have listened to some webinars where they would say, well, this is so much money. And I think the concern was how they would be paid. But the flip side of that is this money would be going to them for the services of their patients. So in some ways their volume goes up, even if their payment for those patients might go down, but they might be caring for patients who would otherwise go without any kind of care. Exactly. So, I mean, I think it's kind of a, it was, it would have been a challenge perhaps getting dentists to enroll in Medicare, but it's not unclear. It's pretty unclear what would have happened. And maybe, maybe it would have been more participation than some feared. There's a question for the group. Could vision, hearing, and cognitive screens be part of the Medicare annual wellness visit review right now using for hearing a whisper test or a finger rub? Screen then refer. Does anybody want to speak to that? So, you know, I'll comment briefly. I think, you know, I have a lot of um, uh, close friends and colleagues and uh, research colleagues who are, you know, cherry editions and things like that. And it seems like, unfortunately for them, everything seems to get plugged into that um, annual wellness visit. <laughs> so <laughs> um, uh, it's like, it's, 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 um, she showed me once the, the checklist, everything they're supposed to do. And it's, it, it's, it's a little bit, it's, uh, it's daunting to say the least. Um, so yes, I think ideally it would happen. Um, uh, realistically, I, I think it's really, really hard because you're counterbalancing that against um, doing a fall evaluation and hypertension and, and a lot of things, right? But importantly, and I'll speak specifically for hearing. Hearing is interesting, though, in the sense that, uh, again, uh, demonstrably, if you can actually look at objective audiometric data from the entire United States, I mean, two thirds of everyone over 70 has a hearing loss. So the reason why I say that jokingly in a way, uh, in a way is that you don't really need to do a screening test. I can guarantee <laughs> you they probably already have hearing loss, right? So a lot of times you don't need to do an objective test. You could just, honestly, it, you get a sense of it's impacting them and then quote unquote refer. The key thing out here, which is really nice, which is evolving though, and because this legislation that passed four years ago with, with um, Chuck Grassley and Elizabeth Warren supporting it and uh, the truly bipartisan bill is that in the future, um, in about a year from now, when there's a ro hopefully a ro very robust OTC hearing aid market, it may very well be, well, listen, you, you're having some hearing concerns. Why don't you just go try buying an over-the-counter hearing device and seeing if it helps you? And if it helps you, great, you're done. If not, and you're still struggling, well, let me then, why don't you go ahead and see an audiologist for further advice and counseling and guidance about what to do next? So I think that's that that model, it really empowers patients. Uh, it removes that barrier, removes the process of always having to refer on for something. And you can empower them to do it themselves. And so a lot of it, I think, is very much predicated, again, on you know, if you ask me one that it's a really important piece of legislation that passed, it's called the Overcounter Hearing Act four years ago, which is going to enable this OTC hearing market to develop over the next four years and um, over the next year. The, the draft regulations were just released by the FDA uh, last month. 
and they'll be finalized in the final version and hitting the federal register uh, by about August of next year. So it really is in this convergence time now where the field of how hearing care can be delivered is shifting. And at least fortunately, is the current Medicare legislation is very much synergistic with it. It's not that it replaces it, it's very synergistic that people don't can't be helped by OTC hearing aids, then there's another avenue for getting further care. And I, would just I suppose this will also encourage uh, a low price point, right? That would be the hope that when, when these devices come to market OTC, then they'll yeah. be relatively affordable for people. Yeah, absolutely, Trisha. I think what's projected, no one really knows for a fact yet what's going to happen. But I think if you look at the component costs of a good hearing aid, it's no different than what a, a hearable would be. So for example, I'm using my Apple AirPod Pros, I guess they're like roughly $250. So there's no reason why a hearing aid at a, when you go to, at the commies, a scale of a mass market and direct to consumer sales per se, uh, that it wouldn't be in the essentially hundred to a few hundred dollar range, right? Which is a far cry now than um, uh, the current price point for how to get a pair of hearing aids. Which is thousands of dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Carrie, did you want to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say in regards to vision, there is an opportunity to assess vision as a part of the welcome to Medicare benefit um, that happens just as they join. It's supposed to be a visual acuity screen, uh, and we've actually tried to seek out the data from those screens, and certainly there's no data required to be captured during the screen, so we don't know if it's happening or not. Um, and there's not really a lot of education that, that people are getting as to what should be happening in that welcome to Medi Medicare benefit. So if it's skipped, Nobody's really talking about it. And in regards to the, the annual wellness benefit, um, certainly you can ask somebody if they're having a concern with their vision or maybe the provider observes, hey, they're wearing a pair of glasses, which may be a pair of readers that they got at the dollar store and assume, oh, they're probably under vision care. I'm not gonna ask about that. Um, or, or if you ask and they say, no, I don't have any concerns, that individual may actually have the starts of eye disease that can lose, you know, peripheral vision or loss of other areas of vision that may not impact their visual acuity yet. So there could be things happening in vision that will still allow a person to see well, but they're not going to be well in their vision health because nobody's actually looking at it. So we can't just assume when it comes to vision because you can buy really cheap glasses that may or may not be working for you. You can borrow glasses or you may not even realize that you have an issue going on. So, so we need to make sure one, there's data and accountability to make sure the benefits that should be happening are happening, uh, but also having stronger and more robust efforts in these other opportunities, whether it's an annual wellness benefit or if we can get vision actually added in an appropriate manner in Shell, did you want to say add anything? I was uh, just nodding and agreeing. Okay. Um, I want to go uh, take us a little bit further and ask a little bit more for this audience in particular, what research is needed to push the field forward? I, you know, one area of research, which I'd like to put on the table relates to costs because we often hear, well, if you give people the this say vision hearing dental, it's gonna save money for Medicare or the healthcare system. I'd, I'd like to get your thoughts on what's the state of research. I'd like to say that when I've looked, I haven't found it to be terribly robust in this area. And you know, maybe there could be studies that are done that are more refined that would identify opportunities particularly if dental doesn't make it into this final package, uh, are there areas where maybe the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovations could run a model that would test and identify opportunities to achieve savings by providing dental services to specific subsets of the population, similar for vision? What more research could be done? I just wanna start you all on the cost question because that seems to be a, a, a rate limiting step in Congress when the costs are so high and CBO is always asking or people are always asking CBO to offset the cost by some savings and then they say, show me the evidence. So what do you, where, where are you on where's the evidence and what more could be done as experts in each field? I, I saw Michelle, you're nodding. So I'm gonna go right to you first. Okay, um, I, in terms of cost, 
knowing that of the three potential inclusions in Medicare, the dental component would be the most expensive. Um, I think that's where the efficacy of, of quality measures comes into play in terms of evaluating the outcomes in dental care and the affordability. Uh, and they could even throw in interdisciplinary approaches to see if they could save even more money. And that would be right up CMS's alley. And I, I see that uh, one of the folks in our uh, watching audience uh, is a social work question about it's lagging and integrating into the field of dentistry. It becomes absolutely necessary in terms of nursing facility residents to have that social worker intimately involved in getting access to dental care and the affordability of it. So, you know, it's one thing to suggest something for the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovations, but for researchers who are in this virtual room, do you have burning ideas for good research projects that could take place that, that could move forward that would demonstrate what would achieve savings or quality improvements that has yet to be done? Some of these have already been done by the insurance companies. There's a particularly unique one that's out of one of the California uh, companies, and that's being used by the Santa Fe group as evidence basis for why at least preventive services would be so much more affordable by preventing uh, the negative tertiary outcomes. And, uh, and in addition to that, the quality measures that are going to be most likely demanded if it comes through. I would put on the table that more research is needed to put some empirical evidence on the table besides that particular study. Um, sometimes you need to have reinforcements and have more people making the point or refining the point in order for the Congressional Budget Office to buy it. Exactly, it's just a starting place. It's a, it's a great, I mean, it's a great step forward, but I think more is clearly needed. And are there other areas of research outside of the sort of the cost environment that you think um, would be important for, for researchers to pursue? If you're, if you're asking me, I would say yes. Um, one of the things that, that dentistry is, does is lack way beyond medicine in terms of determining the e efficiency, effectiveness uh, of different procedures for various disorders. And there, there's a lot to be done there. Mm -hmm. So that if, if someone needs a prosthesis of some sort, which really does have the better outcome. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to go to Frank because mm -hmm. you're not on mute. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Trish, I completely agree. I mean, when it comes down to a CBO and you know, having spoken before in the past, like, you know, show me the evidence, right? So, you know, the, the hallmark, I think all of us understand is the, the gold standard, whenever we can do it, is a randomized control trial. And I specifically speaking about hearing, I'll tell you the field has uh, hearing aids been around for seven year, 70 years uh, since post-World War II. And there's never to this day ever been a randomized control trial done ever looking at the impact of hearing aids on any of the sort of bigger downstream outcomes, things like healthcare costs, dementia, things like that. So fortunately, I am excited to say though that this trial actually is going on right now, funded by the National Institute on Aging. This is a huge trial going across the United States. A thousand people, uh, sounds small, but that's a big for a clinical trial of this magnitude. A thousand people, 70, 84 years old, mild to moderate hearing loss have now been randomized to hearing intervention versus an aging education control, basically purely a control group. So people are time matched for exposure to study personnel um, that trial is ongoing right now. It's slated to finish end of next year. And that's power initially to look at uh, rates of cognitive decline, whether hearing aids, treating hearing aids can reduce cognitive decline dementia. But the secondary outcome is very apropos to uh, CBO and things like that is looking at Medicare claims data, looking at hospitalizations, falls, and things like that. So um, I, I think whenever we can, especially for the hearing side of things, I think good, even this is a big randomized control trial, obviously, that's huge. It's multi-million dollars, going for many years, but even times smaller trials, just it's some type of you know, small, short-term, truly randomized design where the only factor of interest that's being changed is as, you know, treating heroes or not. I think this make a huge difference. I completely agree. And all too often, people don't do those studies. And the huge issue you can imagine with 
observational data, looking at like, oh, let's say these big data sets, people who use hearing aids compared to those who don't, they do better. But, you know, as we know, people who get hearing aids are likely to be healthier, wealthier, better educated. So it's hard and you can control for that with big enough data sets. And we do, and we try doing that, but no one really quite believes it. Um, right. So I, I'm a big fan of uh, sometimes large, but even sometimes small, well done, randomized controlled trials, even short term outcomes over six months can be meaningful. I agree. Kara, do, do you want to comment on that? Well, sure. Yeah, it, when, it, when it comes uh, to vision, we know that there are excess costs related to, to not receiving the care. So right now we're spending about $171 billion in direct and indirect costs to treat vision problems in our country. And with the way that we have the drivers for vision issues going, aging of the population, increase in chronic disease, increase in, in cognitive decline in other areas, we know that those costs related to vision are going to increase by the year 2050 to $717 billion. So it's going to be a huge increase in costs, increase in, in costs related that the government's going to have to pay, but also a dramatic increase in the amounts that individuals age 90 plus are going to have to pay. Fivefold, those age 65 to, to 85 are going to have to pay a threefold, threefold amount over that time. So those costs are only going to increase if we keep going the way we are. And that's the key, if we keep going the way we are. If we integrate uh, vision into other health professions, if we have uh, earlier intervention in vision problems by getting people access to an eye exam to identify problems, to get them to care, we're gonna drive those costs down. Um, other research shows that individuals with vision loss have longer hospital stays, more readmission costs, um, to the, the tune of about $500 million a year in excess cost. So if we're looking for a way to pay for vision right there, that's an issue, let alone the way that individuals are treated if they have vision loss in those sorts of settings, they have a, a much worse off experience. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we have a lot of drivers of cost. What can we do to see where we can improve things, as I mentioned, research-wise? I see kind of three key areas. Um, right now, we do need to see improved integration of vision in community health centers. I think that's a huge opportunity for us in the United States. Right now, about 2% of community health centers offer vision services on site, mm -hmm. 2%. The total number of staff that provide vision services in fairly qualified health centers makes up less than 1% of overall staff in FQHCs. So we have a huge opportunity to add comprehensive vision care, eyeglasses, referral to other services to that system. And it's such a beautiful integrated system that we'll be able to see the individual identified in their primary health care provider, refer to vision. And if we can have research that shows integration of rehabilitation services, access to low vision devices, you're going to see a population that has an overall better quality of life, better health, and less readmission rates to hospitals because of other complications. So I think that's kind of one opportunity we need to see vision integrated there. We also need to see um, some practices that actually promote uh, maintenance of treatment, adherence to treatment for individuals that are in higher risk populations. Um, individuals who are African American, Hispanic, have a higher risk of glaucoma, diabetes related eye disease and related vision loss. We need to have education programs, we need to have treatment adherence programs, we need to see patterns and ways that we can support these higher risk populations so that they have what they need to be successful in their vision health. And we just don't have that level of population health research yet for vision to see what's successful in those populations. Um, and the third area for research that we really need a huge increase in is um, population health surveillance for vision in the United States. We spend $1 million conducting surveillance for vision in the United States, 1 million, and that's it. Um, and we're using data right now that is up to 30 years old to help to establish our surveillance rates. Um, so we, we desperately need data and we desperately need not just the vision community to be using this data, but different professions to look at how vision is impacting their populations. What will this vision play in mental health? and in other areas of, of healthcare so that it becomes a, lar a part of the larger population. But we really need to have great surveillance data to help make those conversations possible. So desperate for that, definitely. How much of this is training? So when professionals are going through medical school, social work school, nursing, 
you know, all the different professionals that contribute in an interdisciplinary model, social work, you know, mental health care workers, how, how much of this um, training in vision, hearing, and dental occurs among non-specialists? Obviously, dentists are learning dentistry, but are they thinking about, oh, I'm, I'm looking at a patient here who's got hearing issues. That patient obviously can hear what I'm saying, or vision, you know, vision issues. They're having difficulty reading the instructions I'm giving them. Is there a training issue so that people just kind of stay in their silo and they're like, I'm really good at ears. I'm really good at teeth, but they don't really think more holistically about the person because they're not trained that way. Well, I would say, I'm, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Kira. Oh, thank you. Um, I would say there's an interesting trend there. So in the, the realm of optometry, there's very much a push to be seen as a a part of the larger health system. Um, certainly individuals may be more comfortable getting an eye examination than some other kind of medical examination. So they may be in the optometrist chair and that optometrist may actually be seeing diabetes in their eyes uh, more than uh, earlier than they may see effects on other parts of their body. So they may actually see impacts of hypertension, other issues going on in the eye earlier because of such a small uh, a venal system, then they'll be referring over to primary health care provider educating. There's a lot more of that sort of education in the training programs happening right now. I don't know that I necessarily feel the converse is happening, that there's more discussion about vision um, beyond just here's the parts of the eye, here's some basic issues you may encounter. There's not more than a day or two in medical school, from what I've heard, that given to the eye, um, its impact on overall quality of life, mental health, chronic disease, and how discussions about vision needs to be integrated into the larger healthcare. So kind of an interesting uh, difference of approach there. Anybody want to comment on that? Yeah, I, I would. And I think that that's an issue across every discipline and every school that it varies from place to place. Some places do it better where there are um, geriatrics, medical and dental fellows and psychiatry fellows. You're going to see more cross-discipline training uh, than otherwise. I also think that it's changing, but change is slow. Mm. On this note, earlier I was asking you all about Medicare Advantage, which is really managed care. Theoretically, this would be the, the, mm -hmm. the structure that would facilitate coordination across practitioners to manage the care of their enrollees, you know, no matter what their presenting problem may be. In your experience, is that happening? Because I think that's, that's the ideal, that's the, that's, the, that's the city on the hill that, that people talk about. But how, how is that playing out in practice? So, you know, Trisha, a, a comment again, something around the hearing side of things, it hasn't at all. And that's partially because I think it's a carrier effects of Medicare, again, um, and how it's structured for you know, hearing aid, hearing aids and hearing relators being statutory exclusion, that the integration of care is not there for hearing at least because it's always seen as, okay, the only way to help that person is you got to drop three or $4,000, the person needs to get a hearing aid, which is um, by no means accessible or affordable on so many different levels. So, you know, one thing we're again encouraged by with, again, OTC hearing aids coming out, and hopefully there's Medicare expansion to include hearing care benefits, hearing care services. I think it does change that model, hopefully, because then the idea of um, encouraging innovative models that can allow older adults to hear better, it becomes accessible and affordable. You refer on to an audio, audio you're coming to audio just services just for the rehabilitation visit, you know, not for $4,000 hearing aid. Hearing aids, if they're at the scale of $100, $200, um, it, it changes that dynamic of allowing hearing to be integrated into the care model as opposed to the way it is, even though these are managed care that should structure it, the way it's financed, the way hearing aids are available, it doesn't allow it to be integrated quite yet. I am gonna sneak in one question that came in and then ask you all just for like a minute to wrap up if you have any burning concluding comments. But this one came in, it sort of came in the door through dental and it said that the ADA has proposed dental coverage should be means tested, a means tested mm -hmm. Medicare benefit available to people below 300% of poverty. 
there are trade-offs involved in this approach. And uh, I guess the question is, what do you think about this for dental vision or hearing? Should it should should Medicare, this would be kind of a break in precedent because Medicare is a social insurance program available to people without regard to income. Is this something in your view Medicare should do or should it be a benefit like all other benefits without regard to income? Anybody wanna take a crack at that? I would just comment that uh, means testing is pretty much reserved for Medicaid, not Medicare. And I think it would present a lot of problems because then the vast majority of people will not get the care at all. Anybody else? Trisha, you know, means testing, obviously, you, you know better than I do. There's uh, There are a lot of uh, devils in the details. Sounds good on theory, but devils in the details. Um, I, I think for hearing care in particular, I think it doesn't make as much sense. Again, um, in the context of if, if everyone was you know, supposed to get a free hearing aid, then I, I mean, maybe theoretically, but again, the, at least how the Medicare benefit structure now is, it's already offset that the, the, the 85 to 9% people with hearing loss would actually be buying their hearing aid on their own from the get-go, right? So it's only the five to 10% of the more severe hearing losses who would need the benefit. I, so I think it comes less into play, um, quite simply, because, you know, for one respect, to, and I think that's why the beauty of OTC is there, is that, you know, tongue in cheek, you know, why should my tax out pay for someone's Apple hearing aids? Well, they're not. That person can buy their own Apple hearing aids, but if they need professional services, those do, be, those do become covered, fortunately. And I think that would not necessarily be means tested because that's just getting professional services to guide, guide and counsel you. It's not for, quote, unquote, a high cost pair of hearing aids. So I think it makes a little less sense for hearing care the way it's struck, how that would work, though. Terrific. Well, I'm getting all sorts of signs that say it's time for us to wrap up. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to just say before I give each of you a last word, I think this has been an incredibly interesting panel on a really interesting topic. I'm pretty convinced that there is more work to be done by the clinical and research communities to put some more information on the table uh, for whatever reason at the moment, it looks like hearing might be moving forward and that would be an enormous breakthrough for Medicare, but not vision and dental unless something happens in the Senate. Now would be the time to come forward with more information. And actually, if it doesn't happen immediately, then we have years to do it, but it's important to do it. So very quickly, anybody have a burning final one, less than one minute comment that you wanna to convey to this audience before we wish everybody well? I would just say that the research still has to be done in hearing because we are, um, getting information that there are people in the Senate who don't want the hearing benefit to go through either. So I think we all have to make our points, no matter how many more years it takes us to get funded, we have to do all the research we need so we can lay it out for whoever it is is gonna make the decisions. Agree. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Well, I'll just dive in there and say that, that vision, sensory health, oral health, it, it all needs to be considered in a holistic view of a health approach to older adults. Um, you know, research has shown for vision, there's, there's a direct connection, as we mentioned, for the other areas between vision, mental health, cognitive decline, increased risk of falls, increased costs for hospitalization, long-term care. These are things that are unnecessary. Um, so if we're taking care of the ways that we're getting input into our bodies, whether it's hearing, vision, oral, we're going to be better off throughout the rest of our body. A decision, in my opinion, to not provide coverage for vision care and Medicare means that we are accepting an increased loss of independence, quality of life, and equity in the health of older Americans, and we all deserve better. So my final thought would be time to go talk to a senator. <laughs> Terrific. Um, Frank, do you want to say anything? You know, maybe I'll echo that point again. I think you know, we're entering an interesting era of public health now, which some people, some people say we're entering this third era of public health. The first era being sort of controlling infectious diseases for the first time. Second era basically being from the 20th century controlling uh, the non-chronic chronic diseases. So basically things like hypertension, diabetes, controlling that better and better. 
And now because of those, those wonderful successes, we're able to so many more older adults. Going. And the question is, how do we optimize the health of older adults going forward and controlling the disease is no longer enough. So the idea of essentially the sensory, the dental, right? Those become critical now to optimizing the health of the aging population. Um, so I think it was a huge exclusion from Medicare many years ago, uh, maybe understood back then, and, and, and understood, understandable at that time. But I think nowadays with an aging population and we opt, want to optimize our health, it, it is going to be through things like hearing, vision, dental. There's no doubt about it. Living longer and living better. Mm -hmm. That seems to be the key. Well, I want to thank everybody. This has been a great discussion. Thanks to our audience who um, would join me in clapping for our panelists if they were all in the room. Um, so, so thanks again. And hopefully by the, maybe when we come back next year, we will hear all about OTC and we will hear about progress made on all of these benefits. Be lovely. Um, thank you. Thank thanks, you for Trisha. leading us. So Bye everybody. Bye everyone. Bye-bye.